everyone, this is Declan. I'm a confidence and purpose coach and author and a keynote speaker from Sydney, Australia. I've just finished up my session discussing cultivating confidence on the Carry On Harry talk show. I had an amazing time sharing some key tips and insights on how you can actually develop the skill of self-confidence in order to live a more thriving and flourishing life. Once again, thank you so much for having me on board. Uh, definitely check out the content. I know that you're going to get a massive change out of it. If you did want to find out more about us, feel free to visit us at bucoaching.org. Follow the links to the Cultivate Confidence course and we'll connect again soon. Thank you for joining Asia's best radio station. Download latest podcasts of Carry On Harry Show on iTunes. Now shake hands with celebrities on Singapore talk show Carry On Harry. Inviting music composers, producers, artists on board on Carry On Harry talk show for connecting you to worldwide audience. Write to Harry Johal at carryonharry.com or visit www.carryonharry.com for more details. Friends, welcome to yet another episode of Carry On Harry Show with your talk show host Harry Johal. And today I'm very much pleased and excited to invite my guest, Mr. Declan Edwards, on the show to talk and discuss about cultivating confidence. Declan is an author, he's a confidence and purpose coach and entrepreneur and a keynote speaker. He's joining us all the way from Sydney to discuss and give some golden nuggets about how we can build confidence in our own personality. Hello, how are you doing? I'm perfectly fine, Mr. Declan. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Well, it's a, a honor for me as well, you know, coming, uh, you know, all the way from, uh, you know, uh, Sydney and joining me in my studio in Singapore, you know. And giving all those uh, golden nuggets that I am expecting from you, you know, about the topic of confidence, uh, which many people, you know, they think they are confident, but uh, actually, uh, sometimes in life, we need more than what we think. Without a doubt. Yeah, I think that's a great way to say it, you know, to really understand what it is that we actually want as well. Correct. So, uh, my first curiosity is to know more about yourself. Uh, what brought you uh, to become an author, a keynote speaker and an expert who is uh, dealing with the topic of confidence? Yeah, so I actually spent most of my life incredibly unconfident. Um, I was overweight for most of my life and had very low self-esteem. <laughs> and then I actually went into the field of health and became a personal trainer and ran a uh, personal training and nutrition company because I'd lost a lot of weight, but what I ended up realizing was just because I'd lost weight didn't mean I'd become more confident. If anything, I had lower self-confidence. I was more worried about what people thought of me, and I was really struggling with uh, confidence and self-esteem. So I ended up working with some amazing coaches myself and started to study positive psychology and neuro-linguistic programming and really learning more about our mind and how our mindset can create amazing results in life where it can really hold us back and I guess I just fell in love with understanding how people work and really learning how to make massive behavior change by making shifts in their mindset so I closed my PT business my uh, fitness company and stepped right into the field of coaching particularly in confidence coaching and yes yeah, since then as you mentioned I've been lucky enough to write a book and have it published and now uh, coach people not only within Australia but all over the world as well. Correct. Uh, since uh, you have yourself dealt with the, you know, the, the issue of uh, you know, having confidence to project yourself as a personality, uh, since you are concerned about your weight, uh, in your analysis so far, you know, uh, with what is your personal analysis uh, tells you and the analysis that you have made after you know, going through uh, those coaching sessions and learning sessions you know, about the topic of confidence, what is your analysis? What do you think uh, is the main reason that you know, some people are confident you know, every time, but there are people, you know, who hibernate uh, within their own self and they are not able to project what they are. What, what are the main reasons, uh, you know, that make people lack the confidence? Mm. Yeah, it's a great question. I think one of the major ones, I know especially for myself and a lot of my clients, one of the major ones that creates a breakthrough 
is realizing that confidence isn't some rare genetic trait that some lucky people are born with mm. and other people aren't. You know, I think a lot of people, as you mentioned, get stuck in this hibernating state of not being confident to show who they truly are because they end up describing themselves as just not a confident person. They get this story stuck in their head that they weren't lucky enough to be born confident, therefore they'll never be born confident. Uh, and what people need to realize and what we really help teach people is that confidence is a skill. And like any other skill, it can be trained and it can be developed over time. So for me, in my analysis, especially in my life, the big breakthrough was to go, well, hang on, I can learn how to do this. I can develop this, you know, especially because the brain can be retrained and we can retrain our mindset and our thinking patterns. I can train myself to be more authentically and genuinely confident. Get it. And over time, that's exactly what happens. So I think the big first step people really benefit from is recognizing that, hang on, confidence, like any other skill, can be trained and developed. Correct. Here I want to, you know, reverse uh, the statement, you know, uh, in this way that, uh, you know, what specific could be the reason, you know, that people, you know, uh, turn out to have, you know, some lack in confidence. I think the upbringing, the environment in which, you know, people are brought by, you know, parents or by the friends group or the teachers in the school, uh, they sometimes, you know, are responsible in, you know, uh, suppressing that personality with which we are actually born, you know, the skills that has been, you know, bestowed upon us. Uh, you know at the time of birth but the environment around us sometimes you know causes us to get you know programmed in that way that you know the confidence level goes down and uh, you know a very different personality you know uh, emerges out which is more like you know uh, doubtful about the things which is more like submissive which is more like you know introvert kind of a thing do you think that uh, the environment around us also contributes towards you know having uh, you know lack of confidence Definitely, yeah, definitely. So the environment around us, you know, spe specifically as you mentioned, how we're raised, who we're around, uh, has a massive impact on how we feel about ourselves. And a lot of the time we adopt these stories and these beliefs about ourselves that aren't even ours. We're adopting these stories that other people have told us. So, you know, if someone else uh, looks at us a certain way or believes a certain thing about us, if that happens enough times, we can tend to believe it ourselves. Uh, which, as you mentioned, can really detract from our, our self-confidence. But at the end of the day, all confidence is, right, is is a feeling. Like, you can't hold confidence, you can't pull it out of your wallet or stumble over some confidence someone left on the ground. Confidence is just a feeling. And so really the leverage point and the secret to developing confidence is to really understand your own emotions and be able to manage them Good. rather than letting your emotions manage you. Correct. I want you to give one example, you know, one brief example where, you know, uh, people can understand or parents can understand how they can, you know, uh, make their own child, you know, uh, have lack of confidence when they are bringing them out. Just one example will be more than enough to, you know, nail and, you know, put the thing into the mind of people's mind. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, in terms of with parents raising kids, the funny thing to notice is that Kids seem to be naturally born with confidence in them. Correct. Like kids under five years old don't tend to hesitate or second guess themselves as much as we do as adults. And I'm sure if you looked back at, you know, photos of what you used to wear as a kid or things you used to do as a child, you'd think, oh God, what was I thinking? Uh, but then, you know, you don't second guess it as a child. You just go, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing. And I'm going to go ahead and do that. I think that's quite beautiful. And over time and over our life, as you said, unfortunately, we begin believing all these other stories that we're told and it can detract from our confidence. So I think a big thing for parents is to give uh, their child some leeway of, of self-expression. Like help be a guiding force, but don't be authoritarian with it. Okay. Don't be that, you know, strict authority figure that goes, my child has to do this or has to fit this mold in order to be happy and successful. Absolutely. Give them a bit of freeway to have um, personal choice in that too. Absolutely, absolutely. Don't do this, don't do that. This is wrong for you, that is wrong for you are the walls that sometimes, you know, we create in the mind of a child, you know. A child is born with curiosity and this curiosity wants them to explore the things. Let's say there's a, there's a pet in the house or, you know, we visit some place and the child just walks to the dogs without thinking any consequences. But the parents are the one who says, don't go there, don't touch him, don't do this. So these are some, sometimes these things are good, but... Ultimately, 
it becomes a habit of a parent you know to all the time you know uh, ask the child not to do certain things and in this process the curiosity goes down and the doubt and the fear creeps in and ultimately the 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 child psychology develops into something becoming you know shy to do the things something of a scared uh, mentality about around anything that they really want to explore but they uh, ultimately are not able to so moving ahead uh, as you earlier mentioned, uh, Declan, that uh, you know, conf confidence is basically a skill, and that is a good news. That skills can always be learned. And since you are one coach who is dealing in cultivating confidence, so tell us a little bit about you know, uh, what are the areas you know where people can build uh, confidence, and how does it actually works? Yeah, definitely. So. As I mentioned, confidence, you know, you're right, it is a skill, it's also an emotion, it's a feeling. So the best way for people to develop that is, as I mentioned before, to get really clear on understanding their own emotions, their own feelings, so checking back in with themselves. So we talk about emotions and feelings being created from two things, and that's one, your thinking patterns and your psychological patterns, and two, your physiology, so what you're actually doing with your body has been shown to have a massive impact on how you feel. So if you breathe a certain way or you're sitting a certain way in a certain posture, it's shown to actually change the emotional state you're in without changing anything around you, which when I first learned that, it blew my mind. So a quick way for people to begin training and developing confidence is to first go, well, what specifically is confidence to me? Because you know, your idea of confidence might be very different to my idea of confidence. Absolutely. So when people get clear on what they actually want, like what does confidence feel like? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What mm -hmm. do they do when they're confident compared to when they're not? That clarity can really help them begin stepping forward into it because you can't train a skill without first understanding it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, here something is coming to my mind. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we might have noticed that, you know, some people are very confident when they are at home. Like parents can say, my son is very confident or my daughter is very confident, you know, I can always hear positive and, you know, full of energy at home. But I don't know what happens when the child goes outside, goes to the school or goes to the college. And certainly I find that, you know, people find the, the, the person is not, you know, uh, uh, that open up. And I think here is the, here is the, uh, what you just now mentioned, that reason that, the home environment is something in which they have already grown up, but our life is also playing a major role in, in, in the external environment. I think it's here, you know, where the difference really comes into, you know, becoming, you know, successful in life when we are facing out, out to the world. And uh, just now you mentioned that the emotional awareness and management is one way of, uh, you know, handling up the thing. Tell us a little bit about how we can really, you know, uh, cope up with this emotional programming, you know, which is very difficult. Physical one, yes, we can, but uh, emotional one sometimes don't allow that physical thing to happen. Mm, yeah, gotcha. So, I mean, in particular with the example you're saying where, you know, some people can be quite confident at home, but they're not confident outside of home, that really regularly we find comes down to how familiar and comfortable and certain they are in a space. Because the human brain thrives on certainty and comfort. It doesn't grow there. It doesn't, you know, personal growth happens when we're outside of the comfort zone. But our brain really likes keeping us somewhere where we're familiar. Because if you think about the brain's job, its job's not to make sure that you're happy or confident or living a flourishing and thriving life. Your brain has one job, and that's to make sure you're not dead. Fantastic. <laughs> so... Right? So when we think, okay, well, I'm at home, I'm safe, I'm comfortable now, and I'm not dead, the brain goes, this is a great thing. So it doesn't really mind that you're not feeling confident, you're not flourishing, you're not thriving, because as far as it's concerned, when we're outside the comfort zone, when we're doing something unfamiliar, when we're doing something new, and we're outside of that, you know, safe space, be it home or anywhere else, it doesn't know what's going to happen. Correct. So a big part of confidence is being able to be okay with uncertainty. And begin retraining the mind and retraining the brain to be okay with uncertainty and to a further extent with failure. Correct. So we have underlined the basic, you know, problem, you know, that we all face sometimes, you know, we can see this problem, you know, coming around in, in, in somebody, you know, whom we are very close or it can, sometimes can be in our own life as well. So I want to know how does a coach can really make a difference, you know, to build up that confidence? What Let's say we are having, we have underlined the problem, okay, I have a problem, you know, where I am not able to face up the world, but I am very confident at home. So what should be, 
what would be the proper way for a coach to handle this thing? How can, how would you convince, you know, a parent that after going through the cultivating confidence program, you know, the difference will be made? Yeah, definitely. So I think the massive benefit of working with a coach, I know it's the benefit for myself as well as what I do with my, my clients, because I still have my own coaches. I've been working with coaches now for five years. Um, and I keep working with coaches because it empowers me to see my blind spots. So it's almost like having a mirror reflecting where I can go, oh, I didn't realize I was doing that. Because as I said before, confidence is an emotional state. And emotional states are created by our thinking patterns and our, you know, our psychological patterns, as well as by our physiology. A coach is trained to look for patterns in what we're doing from a thought space and physiologically. And bring those patterns together and go, hey, can you see that you're doing this and it's taking away your ability to be confident? And when people see that and have that light bulb moment, it really empowers change. So our five steps of change we have to take people through to get a massive result is awareness, because if we can't see it, we can't change it. Understanding, again, because we can't make any change if we don't know how it's working. Acceptance and being able to go, okay, this is where I'm at at the moment. And then a conscious change in state or in our emotional uh, feeling and a conscious change in behavior because that's the big one, right? Confidence mm -hmm. coming through as a behavior as well as a feeling because people don't do what they know they should do. We do what we feel like doing. So the secret to behavior change and acting more confidently is changing your emotional state and changing, you know, how you feel confidence and being able to cultivate that. Correct. Uh, here I want to remind my listeners that uh, right now we are discussing the topic of uh, building up confidence with author, confident and purpose coach, entrepreneur and keynote speaker Mr. Declan Edwards who is joining us all the way from Sydney to discuss the topic of how a person can identify the problems they might be facing in, in the field of confidence and whether confidence is something that we can really build up or whether confidence is what is given to us uh, as, a, as, as a child when we are born and we live with the same thing. Uh, Mr. Declan, what do you think, why sometimes, you know, people are not able to you know, step out of their comfort zone? What are the common uh, reasons, you know, which uh, don't allow people to reach their full potential? Mm, definitely. So, well, one, there's two main reasons that people really struggle to step outside their com our comfort zone. One is... Uh, it's an evolutionary one. We, we actually have programmed into a very early part of our brain. It develops very early in life. A thing called the negative cognitive bias, which means that when our brain is thinking of a potential future outcome, it is three times as likely to come up with a negative outcome than a positive one. And if you think about this, this was very useful, right, a, a thousand years ago when we used to all be hunters and gatherers, because if we were all walking through the long grass hunting and we heard a rustling in the grass next to us, the people who had the negative cognitive bias that went, that's a predator, I should be on guard and ready, were the ones that survived. And the positive thinkers, the people who naturally thought, oh, that's just my friend from the cave next door, you know, they were eaten. So over generations, we've had trained into our brain that it's beneficial in terms of keeping us alive for us to think of the worst case outcome first. So then when people are thinking of, okay, this is getting me out of my comfort zone, there's not much certainty or security here, what could happen, it's already pre-programmed for the brain to come up with, well, here's the worst case scenario. And of course that scares people away and we stay in our comfort zone. And that happens within five seconds. So in under five seconds, the brain can create that and stop us from taking action and keep us in a place of inaction and comfort, Correct. where of course we don't grow. Correct. Here, to my understanding, I can put the things or summarize the thing in this way that uh, it's just like uh, our body or our physical personality. We might be six feet, six and a half feet or five feet or four feet, you know, whatever it is our height. It's just like a computer hardware and it all depends on the internal software, how well that hardware can be managed because ultimately thoughts are what, you know, encourage us or prompt us to do or take certain action in our life. Unless that software has already, you know, been repaired, you know, through a coaching program like you are offering, uh, cultivating confidence, I think uh, um, many things can go wrong. And it's not just about the coaching part. In fact, we are getting coaching every day from the circumstances around us, from people around us. There's somebody, you know, who is trying to change our programming in positive or negative way. 
but it gets very very important for us to correct our thinking aspect so that we can really reach our full potential so as a coach uh, what would you recommend you know for people you know uh, to build up confidence if they are not at a stage you know where they can afford a coach yeah definitely so as i said the first step for building confidence you know obviously my biggest recommendation is is if you can work with a coach and obviously if you can't work with a coach for whatever reason uh see if you can do an online course or read some books or something that a coach has put out that has their knowledge in it but is much more accessible and affordable um that's the main reason why we're launching the cultivating confidence online program to make it much more affordable and accessible to people um all around the world but if that's not an option either the first step you can take on your own to begin growing your confidence is getting really clear on what confidence is for you and what thought patterns and physiological traits are holding you back from that so if there's a thought pattern of you know for example oh why did this happen to me we call that victim's mindset life is happening to me i'm the victim of life um and i'm outside of the locus of control i can't make any change there such an awesome change to from, go from victim's mindset to victor's mindset is to flip that question why did this happen to me to how did this happen for me what can i learn from this how can i grow from this how can i use this negative experience and turn it into a positive uh area for growth so that i can continue growing and developing because confidence really does come from uh encountering a negative or challenging situation and then growing through it like I think, uh, no matter how good you are in life life is always going to throw curveballs and difficult situations at you correct. so confidence really comes from being able to handle those and grow through them correct 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 what you just now mentioned i think the defense mechanism is uh, you know uh, the culprit you know we immediately get into that groove you know where we try to defend you know i did everything well but why did this happen to me or you know i means i put my all efforts my all knowledge but i don't know every time i do this thing i fall into you know a failure or something so I, what you just now mentioned is uh, you know what i have underlined is that it is a thought process which is the main culprit you know which has uh, you know uh, made us like a you know conditioned you know or a seasoned player you know to defend uh, each and everything that we do and we think we are very confident about the thing but ultimately you know there is something within our own execution of our plans that 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 really gets flawed uh mr declan what are the common myths that people have about confidence yeah so the common myths people have about confidence the biggest one is that uh some people have it and other people don't and the people who don't have it are never going to that is such a myth and obviously i've lived through that i spent most of my life incredibly unconfident and living with very low self-esteem and confidence and i've now come through you know training programs and personal growth and awareness and i'm now incredibly confident and in in myself and in my capabilities so i learned firsthand that the myth that confidence is a genetic gift and you might have it or you might not is an absolute lie like you can learn to do it like anything else and an easy way to prove that is you know think to the first time you ever drove a car i can guarantee you weren't confident the first time you got behind the wheel it was terrifying and challenging and you thought god can i ever do this fast forward a few years for most people driving becomes a very easy thing get it get it and they're very confident in their ability to do it so all that changed there was they rehearsed the skill of driving to the point where they could become confident in it and confidence in yourself is the exact same the more you practice it the more you rehearse it the more it becomes an inbuilt habit get it uh are there some ways you know that a person can you know self analyze himself or herself you know whether the the personality is of confident kind or whether it is not do you think uh, observing our body language at home and outside where, where we work or where we go and meet people do you think the body language understanding our body language can really uh, you know remind us what is it that is lacking within us we might be very well dressed but we are not carrying that body language do you think uh, it can be a good way to check self check ourselves definitely yeah definitely so in terms of checking back in with ourselves to better understand how we do confidence be it in body language or thought patterns or you know, physiological patterns like how we breathe how we hold our posture the, there's two really great ways to check in and see that and the first one is meditation 
And there's amazing resources out there for meditation. There's a, a ton of free resources um, online to help with meditation. But meditation just allows that calm, that peace, that clarity to be able to check in and see, okay, what's actually going on within? What's actually happening for me inside my own head? Because we're very trained to look outwards at the world around us. And meditation really does help look within. The second one is a thing called active journaling. And this is probably my favorite method for myself to use as well as a lot of my clients. Uh, active journaling is just say you go to a social situation or a party and you weren't confident and you really struggled with confidence there. You know, the next day when you're reflecting on that, rather than reflecting on getting stuck in the, that negative self-doubt spiral of, oh, I should have been more confident. Why can't I be confident? You know, why is this happening to me? Because that doesn't get us anywhere. Active journaling is really powerful in that you give yourself a question. Maybe it's, okay, how can I be more confident next time? And then you set a two-minute timer, and for that two minutes, you write whatever comes to your head. So no filter between head and paper. Go on any tangent you want, hit whatever blocks you want. I find it's such a great way to get all these thoughts that we have in our head swirling around out on paper where we can actually look at them and analyze them and understand them. Wonderful. You have uh, mentioned two very good techniques, meditation and another is the active journaling. Uh, I want to dig a little bit you know, deeper into the term meditation. Normally when we hear about meditation, people say every thought should be out of your mind. You know, you should be focusing at one specific, you know, uh, you know, point where, you know, nothing is coming to you. You're total, you know, in a state of blankness. Uh, in that meditation, if we are going to focus about and an analyze about, you know, our, uh, you know, personality traits, our thought pattern, uh, in your in your terms, uh, how how can we really meditate? You know, uh, uh, I want you to, you know, dig me a little bit deeper into that that aspect. How will meditation Definitely. help me? Yes, please. Yeah, so there's a, there's a few different types of meditation we've found. So there is the very traditional meditation where the goal is to empty our minds and be calm and be still and achieve that peace and tranquility that comes with emptiness. Mm -hmm. And that's beautiful and proven to have amazing benefits both psychologically and also in physical health. The struggle with that is once we go back to our normal day-to-day -day lives, all those thoughts come flooding back in. Correct. So we've achieved emptiness whilst we're meditating, but as soon as the meditation's over, we're back to our normal swirl of thoughts and we're still struggling to handle them. So, as, you know, as much as we advocate that type of meditation, because it is proven to be very beneficial, the type that we also really like to integrate is meditation that's not aimed at emptying the mind, but rather in gaining clarity. So it's meditating over a particular thought or a particular topic and exploring it non-judgmentally. So being able to think, say the topic is confidence. If I were to meditate on confidence, I'd first get myself in a really calm and peaceful state. And, you know, meditation can be done anywhere, whether you're sitting, lying down, standing, just in a place where I know physiologically, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable. And then I slowly focus on my breath just to calm my mind. And then I'll just begin turning my attention to confidence. I'll just think about it, what it is, what it means to me. You know, I may reflect on a memory. I know in meditations for us, Accessing memories when we were confident is a very powerful way to learn how to do it again. So in my meditation, if I'm meditating on confidence, I can go back to a memory in my past where I was confident, maybe only for a split moment. But in that moment of awareness, I can see so clearly, oh, at that time I was doing this, I was thinking this, I held my body this way, you know, my body language said this. This is starting to look like my strategy for doing confidence. And I can take that awareness out of the meditation and begin practicing that. Wonderful. That was really, that was really wonderful. And uh, I want to just, you know, add up a certain, uh, you know, uh, thing from my own, uh, you know, personal experience. Uh, you know, during that state of meditation, even we can, you know, have this thing in mind, you know, we can push our dream a bit further, you know, uh, like, like adding up a little bit of visual, you know, what I will feel, you know, once I am going to achieve a certain target or a goal. You know, I think that, since is a reprogramming of our mind and if we can see ourselves you know achieving that goal within that moment of confidence when we are very very clear i think uh, once we will be out of the meditation it will give us a very positive kind of an energy you know to outgo and do something which we haven't done at that specific uh, moment and we want to really push ourselves into doing rather than about thinking about the same aspect do you think definitely correct thank you so much yeah 
So if you want to add anything further to this, please uh, give us your insight. Yeah, I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head where you said that when we, so we call that visualization meditation, where we're looking forward and as you said, extending our dreams a little bit and going, how will I feel when I achieve that goal? Like, what difference is this going to make to my life? When people immerse themselves in that visualization meditation, it, you're right, it, you come out of the meditation in a very different emotional state. People feel more empowered, more driven, more passionate, more motivated, automatically more confident. And when that emotional state changes, you're right, they're going to go out and do things they've never done before because, as I mentioned before, people do what they feel like doing. So by changing their emotional state from that meditation, they're more able to go out and do different behaviors. Okay. And you're spot on. I cannot agree with you enough when you said it's not just about thinking about it. If you want to make a massive change to your life, you have to go out and apply it and take action. Absolutely. It's not enough to just think about the change. I, I love that you mentioned that because it's something I believe in so much. Correct. I, and from this specific point, we have our topic of discussion is I want to, you know, extend it a bit more further for our audience. Uh, the best way to notice the difference between ourselves before meditation and after, you know, having this visual kind of a meditation is our body language certainly we can see that you know our chest is you know blown up and you know we are feeling more agility you know that that laziness many people think meditation is all about you know getting lazy and you know okay once i'm i'm now very comfortable you know not that is not the feeling that we want to generate the feeling that we want to generate is that we have come from a safe zone where you know everything has been granted to us and we know that yes this is possible and certainly we can observe that our you know way of breathing we our posture of standing or sitting or you know looking around has totally completely changed in fact our tonal quality the voice quality and everything in a way you know it it really pops up do you agree with this statement and i want you to add a little bit further to that yeah definitely so we talk about three things when we talk about living in a really thriving and flourishing state and really emotionally thriving in life we talk about your thoughts your physiology so what you're doing with your body and your feelings and i think you've hit the nail on the head where you know you've done a great meditation when you come out and all three of those things have changed your thinking patterns are different than when you went in how you feel is very different than when you went in and as you mentioned everything from how you speak how you hold your body how you walk how you observe changes so all three areas of living a really emotionally thriving life those thought patterns, the physiology patterns, and our feelings and emotional state, they're all changed by a great meditation. And this, a similar thing happens when people really do a great active journaling process too. Thank you for being in tune with Best Talk Show, Carry On Harry, with entertainment editor Harry Johal on Balabala Radio. Inviting music composers, producers, artists on board on Carry On Harry Talk Show for connecting you to worldwide audience. Write to Harry Johal at carryonharry.com or visit www.carryonharry.com for more details.